Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Oh, let's give Him some more praise. To do that tonight. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. I was getting worried that some of you might need some Starbucks. Make it through the shift here tonight. Till that choir got to sing it. Felt like four hour energy drinks, didn't it? Whoo, hallelujah. It's waking up some people around here. Beautiful, beautiful choir singing. Thank you so very, very much. Open up your Bible with me, please. And I have a second opportunity tomorrow, so I will dispense with some of the preliminaries here tonight. And I want to read to you. I do feel to preach tonight. I hope that's okay with you. I didn't get a nap either today. Amen. But I do feel like the Lord would want me to be a blessing to this church. And I want to endeavor to do that from Ezekiel chapter 33, familiar, familiar scripture, and also from Hebrews chapter number 13. Thank you for this invitation to be here with you. Ezekiel chapter 33, you know it so well. It's verses six and seven. Amen. Ezekiel 33, verses 6 and 7. But if the watchmen see the sword come, blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 17. Obey them that have the rule over you. Submit yourself, for they watch for your souls. As they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable to you. I want to preach tonight on this subject, who needs a watchman anyway? Who needs a watchman anyway? Amen. Would you like God to give you a renewed appreciation for the watchman that God's placed in your life? Let's ask God to talk to us. Lord, in the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, we're praying, God. We believe in you, Lord. Hallelujah. Work your work, God. Work your work, Lord. Work your work, God. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. In the modern world that we live in today, just a preacher reading for a text, Hebrews 13 and 17, the world says you're a control freak. And the saints that are crazy enough to go to a church where a preacher believes that verse in the Bible, the world says you're drinking the Kool-Aid. We're living in a society that uh, absolutely has a disdain in their heart for a watchman. 
a disdain in their spirit because there's something that's ingrained inside of all of us that begins at a very young age when you uh, get a child that becomes a toddler, it becomes a progressive nightmare that you go through. They get up on the knees and they start rocking back and forth and you say, go, go, go. And you're just thrilled beyond measure, hoping that you're going to see them that day take their first little tiny crawl. And all of your celebration then leads on to them taking their first step. And, oh, you just, you, you can't believe it. Everybody's got to know about Johnny took his first step today. You should have seen him. You should have watched him. And before then, he's running. And let the fun begin. All toddlers enjoy the fun of trying to run away from whoever's watching them. It's just ecstatic joy to them. It just beats any game that has ever been played is the joy of running just as far as they can get away from you. Amen. And looking back with that mischievous grin that said, I double dog dare you to come after me because I am going to run the socks off of you before you catch me. And they've got that look on their face that said, you know, I, I have outgrown the need for somebody watching over me. I've outgrown that be wonderful if it really were true, but there are adults that have learned to play that game also. I read a book by the uh, Mossad, the chief of the Mossad for the country of uh, nation of Israel, probably the equivalent of our FBI that's here. And he talked about how much fun that it was to him as the head of the agency to walk into a building. And the men that were supposed to be watching and tailing him and how to make as quick of turns as he possibly could to get out the door they least expected that he would get out. And then count how many minutes it took for them to finally catch up with him. Not only in the nation of Israel, but if you've ever read the Secret Service, fellas, they're really not looking forward to this next election that's coming up here in this country that we're still a little free to criticize. Amen. Because they wrote about Hillary Clinton. And they talked about what a monkey she loved to make out of the Secret Service. How hard that she tried to ditch them on any and every occasion. Oh, God, have mercy. Life just keeps on repeating itself. She's still busy ducking and dodging, isn't she? <laughs> Forgive me if you're of a different persuasion than Brother Rush. Amen. <laughs> but the choice that they have to make when they got the Secret Service out of them watching for them is, do I make a mockery out of the thing that they're trying to do to save my life? Or do I start working together with them? Do I make it just a bunch of fun and games? Or do I realize how valuable that it is to have somebody that's watching for my personal safety for somebody that genuinely cares about making sure that nothing nothing happens to me you know our bible is full of some oxymorons that's simply two words of opposite meaning that uh, get put together sometime and we look at them and one of them is right along with this. It's freedom 
and protection. Amen. Freedom and protection. And in the Bible, it, it fits together. A lot of people don't think it does because they're, amen, they're, they're, they're greatly attached to their freedom. They want it. They want to exercise that free will that is there, and they're, they're, they're interested. And I, I, I'm here to tell you that those two must go together. You can't run from protection and maintain your freedom for very long. You can't do that. It's impossible in the world that we live in today. Amen. Another one is law and liberty. Both of those words in God's economy are put together. Matter of fact, James described it as the perfect law of liberty. Well, hallelujah. You can't have one without the other. No matter how much you want liberty, there's got to be some law that goes along with it or the liberty is forfeited. Amen. Had a place up in the mountains and they were trying to describe to us during this terrible drought that California is having how important it was to leave those little baby bear cubs alone. No matter what, and they were describing and writing articles and saying, you will often see those baby bear cubs up in a tree. Don't worry about them. Mama didn't abandon them. Don't worry about them at all. Just leave them alone. Don't try to entice them down and offer them some food and do everything because uh, they explain that the mama bear trains those little cubs, amen, that liberty and law go together. She takes them out of them tight confines of the cave in which they were born, and she the first thing she teaches them is how to climb a tree. And the purpose of climbing that tree is so the mother bear can get those cubs to realize any time danger is present, get your hide up that tree and stay there till mama comes back. Stay there. You want the liberty of getting out of the cave? You want the liberty of running and having a bunch of fun? You want that? Here's the law that goes along with it. Amen. And she teaches them that's the first thing to do. She, When danger comes for one of her cubs that's out there, that mother bear, amen, gives the signal and the little cubs go up the tree and mama bear lures the danger away from them and distracts all of the danger to get them over where it's safe, amen. And, and mama has already taught them, even when you can't see me, even when I'm out of sight, you don't know what I'm doing, but I am giving you the protection that you need. And don't do a thing till I give the all clear signal. Boy. Don't have time to preach it, but wouldn't it be wonderful if our teenagers would feel that way about modern technology? I ain't going to do a thing till my pastor gives the all clear signal. You have no clue about the dangers. Be seated. Amen. They have the law of liberty memorized. Amen. Climb the tree at the first sign of trouble and wait for mama. 
Liberty without law would be suicide for those cubs. Complete, total suicide for them. Amen. It's important that all of us learn that teamwork with our watchmen God has given to us is the only way that we're going to survive the onslaught of the enemy. Amen. You know, when I was first pastoring my church, I, I learned real quick that it's not those little babies alone that love, amen, running away from who was trying to watch them. I learned that saints had a knack for that too. And here I was, this young man. These guys are blessed to have all this experience under their belt before they, amen, get installed as pastor. I was 26 years of age. And here I, I've got all of these ideas of how I'm going to provide this wonderful protection to these folks. And they're playing catch me if you can. Ah, oh, that poor young pup. He doesn't understand that. Amen. He's trying to make us be accountable and call him when we miss on a Wednesday night. Just catch me if you can, fella. Just, just try, try your best to see. And I'm thinking, God trying so hard to provide them some protection and help them uh, to get things right and understand what my job is and my I'm not your enemy I'm your friend and I, I I'm trying my best to help you I went to a neighboring pastor one time I said man you you're an old veteran at this aren't you I said, how long you been pastor? And he said, well, it's almost five years now. Boy, to me, that sounded like 50. You know, I was just there about six months at the time. And I said, tell me something, brother, please tell me. I said, how long do you have to be at a church as the pastor of the saints? Before they quit ducking and dodging from you. And start working with you. As you're trying to be their watchman. You're trying to help them. You're trying to protect them. You're trying to do everything that you possibly can. How long? He said, you know, I've heard that it's five years. He said, but I'll tell you in six months whether it is or not. Oh, and when I reached my five-year mark, what a surprise. You know what I learned? I learned that there's no mystical date on a church calendar. It's an individual choice. For every saint in that church. When am I going to stop trying to make a monkey out of my watchman? Oh, hallelujah. When am I going to get a real appreciation for what he's trying to do for me? And ever saint crosses that bridge by themselves and said, Pastor, for me and my family, you're the watchman of our souls. Amen. And we appreciate it. We love it. Amen. We thank God every day for it. Somebody's watching. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. And you, you will never, never reach that point until protection means more to you than freedom does. Protection means more to you than freedom does. You know the value. You know what it's all about. Went to San Diego Wild Animal Park and I watched. It was feeding time. Jumped on the tram, my wife and I, and 
They took us over to see these African antelopes. We had seen the tiger display, watched the cheetah run right in front of us, chasing this fake little rabbit, and oh man, all kinds of fun things to do, watching these animals and all of their tricks. And now he said, I, I got some feed that's on the back of this tram, and we're taking it over there for them antelope little herd of antelope and he offloaded it they all came and and there was food for them just just i don't know half a dozen of them and as we're driving away he said everybody if you would care to look back he said all of those animals those antelope that are there are all hungry but they're not all eating he said, you will notice there are two sentinel antelope that realize somebody's got to watch the herd at grub time. And we look back and sure enough, one was looking in the direction where he had heard the roar of the lion sometime during that day. And another was looking off over in this direction. Brother, there they were. They wasn't touching the food. Uh, they were just watching intently. And I watched them. He said they will not leave their position of watching for the herd until two others are able uh, to take their place. Uh, they know how important it is uh, to not get carried away uh, in the busyness of life uh, and leave your yourself vulnerable uh, without there being anyone watching uh, without there being anyone observing uh, and the thought hit me wait a minute this is more than what meets the eye you told us uh, that those antelope uh, were born in this wild animal park that means they have never seen a lion take down an antelope. They've never seen one of their own get slaughtered by a tiger. They have never been chased by a cheetah before. But instinctively, they know there's danger. I heard it. I don't have to see it to believe it. I heard it. There's danger that's there. And I've got to take care of them. Amen. Oh, my friend. Uh, hallelujah. Instinctively, uh, a child of God uh, ought to realize in the society that we are living in uh, that there are some dangers uh, that are out there. Uh, oh, you don't have to have 35 Bible studies uh, teaching and explaining to you. Uh, Amen. What's wrong with Hollywood uh, for you to get, uh, amen, an instinctive feeling uh, on the inside of you that uh, said, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know that's dangerous. Well, oh, hallelujah. Had a had a new convert in our church. She just told me, amen, brand new. She never heard preaching against movies. I know, I know the liberal folks think that's all the conservatives do. Every service is preach the standards and the clothesline and all of that. But she had heard the first message yet. Yeah, she will. I promise you she will. But she hadn't heard the first message on that yet. She said, Pastor, I, I think you guys call it, is it conviction? Is that the word? 
I said, well, what, what do you mean, Alma? She said, well, let, let me describe it to you. She said, I, I sat down with my daughter the other day, and we sat down to watch a movie. And she said, this heaviness, uh, yeah, that's the best way I can describe it. Uh, she said, this heaviness uh, just, just came on me, and it wouldn't get off. Uh, and it got heavier and heavier. Uh, and she said, oh, all of a sudden, uh, she said, I looked at my daughter, uh, and I said, honey, mama's sorry. Uh, I, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, we're going to have to get up. Uh, amen. This ain't right. Uh, and said, my daughter was looking back uh, and said, mama, Mama, that's what I was feeling too. Uh, this just isn't right. Uh, what we're doing, uh, it just isn't right. Ooh, hallelujah. Who needs a watchman anyway? Be seated. Instinctively. Oh, you ever heard it preached? You ought to know there's something about the gay agenda. Just makes your body bristle. Instinctively. But some folks don't have a watchman. Some folks run from their watchman. Some folks are determined, determined to not let him do his job. The blessing of a watchman is so fantastic in the scripture. Isaiah talks about he's on duty 24-7. 21 and 6, he said, go set a watchman. Verse 8 he said, I stand continually upon the watchtower in the daytime, and I am set in my ward whole nights. Try to get that kind of service out of your online spiritual guru. Yeah, next time a relative of yours is at the point of death. You're needing somebody to be there praying, getting a hold of God and touching the throne uh, of the almighty God. Uh, amen. Oh, the brick and the mortar stores are going the way slowly being squeezed out by the online stores. Uh, it's an amazing phenomenon. And if you think it's uh, bad for folks my age, you ought to check the generation younger than you and see what's happening. Uh, my son was telling me about the UPS man that was there delivering packages at his house. And he said, he walked in, he had something he had to go home for. He said, are you the owner of this house? He said, yes, sir, I am. He said, it must be Christmas every day of the year at this house. He said, that's all I do is deliver packages. Now, the seduction of the online stores, and I'm wearing garments tonight while I preach to you that I bought online. So I confess the seduction, the seduction of it is if I can find the same brand at a lower price. Yeah, yeah. If I can believe in one God without having to pay tithe. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if I can get baptized in Jesus' name without having to have one of them watchmen pestering me, bothering me, 
over what I'm doing and what's going on in my life and my world uh, and my family. Uh, got a man in our church. He just told it to the church uh, this week. Amen. He lived just, I, I mean, just a couple of blocks away from our church uh, for 30 years. 30 years. Baptized in Jesus' name. Full of the Holy Ghost. Uh, amen. But he lived there and was converted by some guru. Said the Bible way to do this is a house church. You don't need a building. You don't need a, a pastor. You don't need a, a man. You can have truth uh, without any of the hassle of having the watchman. There's a discount price uh, that you can have. Uh, amen. Uh, and he said, oh, my. He said, I, I, I did that for 30 years. And one day, uh, the whole mess blew up. Uh, and he said, I realized there was just, uh, amen, just a little handful uh, of folks that was left. And the guy that was leading the group finally said, I'm done. You can do whatever you want to do. He said, so I walked into your church today, pastor. Today. He said, I walked into your church because we all knew that you preached one God here. We all knew that you baptized in Jesus' name here. But I walked into your church today uh, and I came into the presence of God uh, and I'm set here uh, and said, oh, God, uh, for the last 30 years, uh, I could have had a sheepfold uh, like this uh, for the last 30 years. Uh, I could have had a shepherd uh, like this uh, for the last 30 years. Uh, I could have had somebody uh, that was watching for my soul. I could have had fellowship with the people of God. I could have been blessed by God. Oh yeah. 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 Be seated. The watchman's a wonderful thing because he knows you so well. So well. At the start of a legal trial, a prosecuting attorney called his first witness to the stand. She was a well-dressed elderly lady. The prosecuting attorney approached the woman and asked, Mrs. Jones, do you know me? She responded, why, yes, I do know you, Mr. Williams. I've known you since you were a young boy, and frankly, you've been a big disappointment to me. You lie, you manipulate people, and talk badly about them behind their backs. Yes, I know you quite well. The lawyer was stunned and slowly backed away, not knowing what else to do. He pointed across the room and asked, Mrs. Jones, do you know the defense attorney? She again replied, why, yes, I do. I've known Mr. Bradley since he was a youngster. He's lazy. He has a bad drinking problem. His law practice is one of the worst in the entire state. Yes, I know him too. At this point, the judge brought the courtroom to silence and called both counselors to the bench. In a very quiet voice, he said, if either of you guys... Ask her if she knows me. You will be jailed for contempt. Uh, yeah. A watchman knows the folks pretty good. Matter of fact, there's things they're very uncomfortable about what the watchman knows about their back trail. They're very uncomfortable 
about the details of their life. A watchman knows us really, really well. A watchman is not a hireling. The Bible said the hireling flees when danger comes. A watchman refuses to be a hireling. city that I live in, our church is in the city of Burbank, and they decided to be proactive, and so they sent out the announcement to all the clergymen. Come, the head brass of the police department is going to have a symposium with clergy, pastors, rabbis, priests, and we want to talk to you what to do in the event of an active shooter that comes into your church. Amen. Uh, I, I, I know, I know some of you, <laughs> amen, don't have a clue what it's like to live in Los Angeles. You're probably packing tonight. God bless you. I wish we had you on our legislature. It would just be wonderful. Amen. But what to do? And so all the peaceniks that pretend that they're clergymen all showed up. And there we were. They divided us into little subgroups and put up on the PowerPoint, said we're going to walk you through some slides, different scenarios, and you are going to tell us what would be your natural reaction? What would you do? And so they showed some slides there, and then they would, they would begin. And they said, the scenario is this. You, as the pastor, are in your office. And the young people of the church are in the youth room. And you hear the sounds of gunshot. What do you do? What do you do? Unanimously. I mean, besides me and my son that were sitting there saying, I can't believe this. I can't believe this. They began to say, you call 911, number one. And number two, you lock in place. Barricade yourself inside of your office that's there. And I thought, oh, God, no wonder the people of my city, no wonder they don't understand what a pastor is. They've never had a shepherd one day of their life because we're a family. We're a spiritual family. And you can't tell me for one moment if my kids were in their bedroom and an intruder was in there shooting them up that I'd crawl under the bed and lock my door and call 911. And hope, just hope, that they get there before he gets to me and kills me. You can't convince me that if that was my wife or my mother or my sisters that was in there. I'm not talking about us becoming ninja warriors. SWAT team, step aside. Won't need your bullets today. No. No. But I'm telling you, amen. If there was no way to save them, I'd die trying. I'd die trying. Who needs a watchman anyway? I, I'm telling you, you do. You do. He's the one that'll take the bullet for you. 
He's the one that loves you. He's the one that will die for you. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Amen. Musicians, come if you will. Be seated. I want to tell one more story. His name was Don Smith. He was a man in the church when I came to take the church. He was an old farmer from Ohio. So you got to plug that in to this part of the story. Living out on the farm, a young boy by age 12 would know how to operate all the farm equipment that was there. But Don Smith learned to love his watchman. And when you love your watchman, you love your watchman's wife. You're a hypocrite if you don't. And you love your watchman's kids. You don't ever pick on them. You do everything you can to make the load a little lighter for that man that would take a bullet for you. And so, when my son PJ, I can hear him now telling them how bad, Brother Smith, I want to be the next church bus driver of our church. He had reached the ripe old age of 11. And Brother Smith said, okay, I'll teach you how to drive a bus. Off PJ went. Off the curb, almost into the fire hydrant. I mean, we're talking about a manual transmission. <laughs> Made it halfway around the block before. Amen. Brother Smith had to bail him out. He liked PJ so well that 15, the man had bought him a brand new sports car. And PJ talked him into letting him drive that sports car. He loved, he loved my family. It was just like his own. He loved my family. He got sick. His lungs were shot because of the chemicals at Lockheed Aircraft he had worked at for all those years. Now he has an oxygen machine and the tubes that were there. And he walked around his house and would go to the kitchen with his oxygen tubes connected to make cookies for the young people of the church. I said, Brother Smith, oxygen is flammable. <laughs> he said, don't tell me I can't do it, Pastor. Please don't. I got to do anything I can possibly do to help out these young people. Two of them are your kids, Pastor. He said, I want to do everything I can do. And he lived next door to the church. And hot cookies. Amen. Waiting for him after church. But the day came that hospice told me. It looks like we're down to the end, Pastor. And he's led us all to know he wants you here when he passes. I said, I know I'm worried. I got a trip I'm making to far east of Canada. And it's nowhere close to a big airport. So, But I got to go. I talked to him and he said, yes, you can go. I'll be waiting for you when you get back. And I got the call from the hospice said he can't make it through the day. I got him on the phone. I said, Brother Smith, I will catch the first plane I can catch in the morning. And I'll be there. They say you're not going to make it through the night. 
He said, I will, Pastor. I will. He said, I, I got to see you. You're the one watches for my soul. About to make a journey. I need you. I remember rushing, rushing from LAX. As fast as I could, I drove up to his house. Phone contact said he was still alive. He was still waiting for me. I was his watchman. He learned to value that. I walked in, rushed in to his bedside that was there. He looked up at me and he threw his arms out and he lifted himself up in the bed and he hugged me and as we were hugging I felt life ebb from his body and he sunk down gently closed his eyelids gently closed his mouth so his family could see him resting in peace he was about to cross Jordan and he wanted a watchman to watch him all the way to the brink of the water. I'm telling you tonight, don't listen to the fools of this world. You need a watchman. Let's stand together. Let's lift our voices unto the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Oh, are you ready to cross that bridge tonight? Are you ready to stop playing games with your watchmen? Oh, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Are you ready to step out with your family and come up around this altar? And say, count me in, count me in. I need a watchman to watch for my soul. Oh, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For the man of God in my life, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm not going to play games about it. I'm not going to make a big laugh and stock out of the watchman. I'm going to show him I appreciate it. I'm going to show him I love him. Oh, yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. Go ahead. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Five invalid arguments concerning baptism. One, I don't need baptism because I trusted Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. Mark 16 and 16. In John 6, 29, Jesus said faith was a work. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. James 2, 26 says, 
For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. We see in 1 John 3.18, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So, not getting baptized into Jesus Christ is to disbelieve Him. Paul connected faith and baptism. For you are all the sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26-27 2. The thief on the cross was forgiven and didn't need to be baptized, so neither do I. First, nobody can say if he was baptized. That's unknown. The thief died in the Old Testament, and Jesus had power to forgive sins. Before his death, Jesus directly granted forgiveness to some people. Mark 2, 5 through 12, Luke 7, 48 through 49, John 8, 1 through 11. The thief is just another such case. Second, and more importantly, baptism was not even instituted into the New Testament. Salvation in the name of Jesus is based upon his death burial and resurrection 1 Corinthians 15 1 through 7 Jesus did not give the great commission of Mark 16 15 through 17 and Matthew 28 18 through 20 which re requires baptism until much later 3 some in wishing to deny the importance and purpose of baptism claim that the original Greek word EIS which is found 1750 times in Acts 2.38 means to be baptized because you have already received remission or forgiveness of sins. In Matthew 26.28, Jesus said his blood is shed for many for the remission of sins. Did Jesus shed his blood because people already had forgiveness or in order that they might obtain it? For the last several centuries, English speakers have exclusively seen EIS as looking forward and never backward. At least 40 translations say of Acts 2.38 is for the forgiveness of sins. Why change it now to suit those who just want to deny the gospel of God? Colossians 2 and 8. 4. Calling upon the name of the Lord alone saves me. Romans 10, 8 through 13. If that's true, why did Peter, who already preached to the 3,000 repenting Jews, that calling on the name of the Lord saves in Acts 2.21 still requires baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul fasted, prayed, and yet was ordered to get baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus to wash away his sins by water baptism in Acts 22.16. Why? Because they both knew that everyone must call upon the name of the Lord Jesus in all things. Colossians 3.17 And that baptism does also now save us. 1 Peter 3, 21. Paul mentions that baptism in Jesus' name gets us into Christ in Romans 6, 3-5, written in 66 AD. Therefore, we must use his name in our baptism. Salvation began in the book of Acts on 33 AD. Not later. Paul always baptized in Jesus' name for the forgiveness of sins as in Acts 16, 15 through 33, 18, 8, 19, 5. We must properly understand and study the scriptures. 2 Peter 3, 16, 2 Timothy 2, 15, 5. The sinner's prayer, invented and made popular by the likes of Billy Sunday, Billy Graham, and Billy Bright saves me. Well, those guys were not the first to challenge the gospel message. Galatians 1, 6-12. In 1523, Ulrich Zwingli, 1484-1531, proclaimed that Jesus, the apostles, and the church fathers were in error. He even contradicted Jesus, calling him a liar, saying things like, Christ himself did not connect salvation with baptism. Yet Jesus said in Mark 16 and 16, believers get baptized. So Wingley said, Water baptism cannot contribute in any way to the washing away of sin. That contradicts the direct words of the apostles and God's man who told Paul to wash away his sins by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus in Acts 22.16. The sinner's prayer is a work that came about by Dwight 
Moody, 1837 to 1899. He modified a system, and it became known as the Sinner's Prayer, becoming popular first under Billy Sunday, then later adopted by Baptist preachers, and even Billy Graham. It replaced Jesus and the Apostles' word on salvation, Ephesians 2.20. Will you trust in God or man? We ought to obey God rather than man. God is the judge and not anyone else. Revelations 22, 18-19, Matthew 44. Have faith in God and His word. John 1, 1-14. Not some man-made salvation formula that saves nobody. I pray today that God's word will find its place in your heart and life. May you hear Him say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you for watching. God bless. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Thank you.